So let's hit, how are we doing on time? We're supposed to break it. Anyway, we're short. So uh, managing project safety. Uh, we'll go through this pretty quickly too, but um, I wanted to, you know, so safety is one of the four pillars of a successful project, right? So being delivering a project on time, delivering it under budget, uh, controlling quality and safety. And, you know, you'll see a little diagram that all the project success is dependent on all four of those, but really, and safety is just kind of one of them, but really if, if you have poor safety, then they all, it's going to cost you more money and you're going to, your quality is going to be bad and you're definitely going to be over schedule. So safety kind of, in my opinion, underpins all those other three. Um, but some of the advantages, now that one advantage is obvious, right? We, we all want our, our workers to go home safely at the end of the day, right? So I'd, that kind of goes without saying. I hope that goes without saying. But uh, if not, then we should, shouldn't be, I don't know. That's a problem. That's another problem that I don't know how to address. Mm -hmm. but, uh, um, but more looking at it from a more pragmatic side, um, how can safety be a profit center? Yeah, so some of it's just uh, you're not paying for accidents. You're not paying for, yeah, you're, if you have a good safety rating, you get cheaper insurance. Is what are you going to say, Lamont? Well, safety affects the bottom line. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, fewer accidents, fewer bills, right? Yeah. Right. So, that, yeah, one accident... You can I you could assign a dollar amount to that to that accident. So assuming if it's a fatality, right? That you, that's beyond just assigning a dollar amount. But it, let's say it's a just an injury, a small injury. You can assign a dollar amount because there's going to be medical bills that you know what they cost, and you m you may be paying dis uh, disability, temporary disability. You know what that costs. But trying to assess, you may have been shut down for three days while OSHA inspected. Well. What's the co how, what's the domino effect there? Okay, now you gotta. So when everyone comes back to work, it's slower, and then not to mention you gotta pay overtime to make up for those lost days. So yeah, the, it's a it it is very much uh, uh, detrimental and it, it throws off the whole project. But like you were s saying, Lamont, so the experience modifier rate, that's that number that will affect your insurance rates, your ins your insurance premiums. So EMR, you'll hear that thrown around a lot in the construction community and among uh, safety coordinators. But the gist of how it works is the average contractor with an average safety rating is 1.0. So if you have an EMR of 1, you are average, which is not necessarily bad. It just means you're average. You know better or worse than they got. And you're only compared to the similar businesses so they don't compare uh, iron workers and painters right or concrete versus you know mill work they're, they're not comparing dissimilar trades uh, you're compared against your peers but one is is average if you have above one that means you're l worse than average if you have below one that's good so you want if you had a 0.7 then you are 70% or I guess it's really the 30 a 30 percent better to get down to the 0.7 30 percent better than average right and the way I remember it is if, if I multiply my print now it doesn't work this it's not this cookie cutter neat but this is the way I remember it so whatever my premium for insurance I multiply it by my EMR and that's what it would be that's not again it's not that neat but that just helps me remember so I want it to be more than one or less than one I want it to be less than one. So the lower, the better. 
which is a direct, it's, it's not this hard to identify, you know, how do we identify the loss of productivity? How do it, no, this is, these are actual hard dollars that I know I am saving every month on my insurance premium. Uh, so it's directly impacting the cost of doing work. Which, why should any of us care? If you can do it for cheaper, you can be more competitive, you're more, more likely to get more work. Right, so that's taking out all the other importances, if we can take that out, the importances of safety. There's real dollars associated with it. And then you add on, man, I'm a better steward to my employees and to society. I don't have to worry about, well, if you stop worrying that accidents could happen, then you're gonna not going to be very safe. But, but I don't, I haven't had those accidents I had to pay for um, in the past that have cost me a lot of money. Uh, so there's real dollars associated with how, not just how profit profitable a past project was, but how competitive you can be in the future. Okay, so it impacts your reputation. So an owner will consider EMR when selecting a, a GC or a construction manager, right? A, a GC or a construction manager will, will consider a subcontractor's EMR. I always, always, always ask for a sub's EMR if I was awarding. Always. You know, if there was, if it was more than one, they'd have to give me a really good example or a, a hard evidence of how they've corrected whatever led them to be more than one. Because it does take a little bit of time. So once you get that rating, it takes some time to, to just, you could implement all the safety measures today and it's going to take some time for that, all the kind of accounting to get and subs should consider a general contractor's or a construction manager's EMR when they're bidding work to them. If, if, a, if a GC or CM has a reputation for unsafe job sites, probably don't want to go work for them. Cause it's probably not because you're just you're putting yourself in a situation. Now I understand sometimes you got to go where the work is. I I, I, I get it, uh, but if you've got options you're going to go with with who has a better safety record or at least better safety reputation uh, you may not specifically ask for their emr but what's their reputation for safety and if you can pick you're going to pick the one so what does that happen to the general contractor well they n they really narrow down who's going to be doing the who, who can bid their work and they're not going to be competitive and oh and so on Government contracts, so written into the language of, at least for the Corps of Engineers, I know for sure. Um, identifying best value, so in that whole picking qualifications versus price, EMR uh, is, is one of the factors. That's one of the things you get points for, for having a low EMR. Again, it's a, it's a tangible way of making you more competitive. Uh, we'll go through some of these pretty quickly. Um, so pre-bid safety planning, and this is on both sides of the table. Uh, the GCs need, need to consider it. Subs need to consider it. Who's providing safety devices and equipment? And don't just talk about it. Don't just make it a phone call. Now, it may, it may start with a phone call, but don't just say, hey, are you providing handrails? Okay, good. I don't want to include that. Be very explicit in your bid, but definitely in your contract. Who's providing handrails? Who's providing safety? So if it's an iron worker, who's providing fall protection? Who's providing uh, stormwater prevention uh, devices? So be very specific. Who's providing? So what do y'all do for washout? The washout pit, I should say. Okay. And do y'all provide it? Okay, and uh, the reason I use washout is because environmental protection is, is often lumped together with safety, uh, job site safety. But if you assumed that the general or the CM had it and then you had to provide it, well, that's something you paid for that you didn't include in your bid. So you want to be very specific. So beyond just washout pits, so all safety, uh, so personal protective equipment, that's kind of assumed that the sub will have it, but it needs to be in writing, right? So, but it goes beyond just PPE, right? And beyond washout, there's a lot of things, safety devices that, it, so shoring for trenches, who provides that? Um, one thing that 
It depends. It depends on the project, right? Yeah, maybe the GC owns some, and they want to use it. They don't want to pay you to put it in. Well, but it's got to be in writing. Yeah. So, uh, being very explicit about who's providing it, who's installing it, who's inspecting it, and all that. It sounds real simple. Oh yeah, well, I'm responsible for safety. Well, really, when you get down to it, there's a lot that goes into just shoring, right, or just scaffolding. So, where is the cost carried, and so? How does this impact schedule? So who's providing it? You need to know when's it getting there. Um, staffing, do you need to provide uh, any sort of, well, how, how do y'all do, uh, say, weekly safety meetings, or do you have on-site safety managers? Uh, yeah, we have safety managers. Safety managers, okay. So they take care of pretty much okay. the safety team. And, um, is that ever included in contracts that you, do they require you to have that or is that something y'all do because you well, see it's important? Just because that's you, because you uh, value it. Yeah, it's just important to you, which is, is great. Yeah, yeah, that's, which is good. That's more than a lot of companies do. But sometimes it's the contract will require, you must provide this. So for y'all, no problem, you're doing it anyway. But what about the guy down the street that's not? Well, he's going to have to either hire you know, a, con a third-party consultant to do it, to be on site all the time, hire a new employee, which is real money associated with that, right? So identifying what are the requirements. Again, we say, oh, yeah, I'm going to have a safe project. Well, that sounds nice, and it is nice, but, but what does it really, how does it really affect dollars? Yeah, so yeah, it's general conditions, cost impact. And here's some more kind of implementation ideas. Um, and a lot of these are in that in that book, kind of the bullet points. But um, so the idea of leading by example, not by words. So don't, this is the, the worst thing you can do is put together a thick safety manual and just hand it to all your field employees and say, all right, we are a safe company. Because who's going to read that? The thicker it is, the less likely it's going to get read, right? So the more time you spend writing it, the less likely it is going to be read. So don't re lead by words, lead by example. Um, so you should know what's the safety record of all your super, so whether foremen or superintendents, whatever you call them, your different crews. You should know their safety records, not just your company as a whole, right? Uh, and, and with them, communicate. So the folks running the work on site, they should know what, you're spending on safety. They should know, hey, we have a safety supervisor, and this is why we have it. Um, so integrate with cost and schedule planning. Um, do y'all do, uh, I'm sorry, I'm picking on you because you're, right, you're sitting right here, but um, so what about uh, like site orientation where you get a new employee? How do you handle that? Okay, so, so you on a one, okay, so on you, do, you do it on a one by one yes. basis, okay, whenever which, yeah. So okay. Two or three, the amount should not be touched like that. Okay, okay, because there's not really one right way to yeah. do it. There's lots of different ways to do it, yeah. So, but that's something you've got to plan for, and, and maybe it can be, yeah, one on one. There's no little cost associated with that. But if you've got a new, whole new crew, there may, you may have to hire someone to come yeah. to. Again, there's these things we take for granted. There's real dollars associated with them, right? Um, and the environmental, we'll go through that kind of quickly. But so just like you want between a GC and a sub, or owner and a GC, or you know the the site safety stuff, you want to identify who's providing the fall protection, who's providing the trench shoring, who's providing this, that, and this. Same with environmental pr uh, protection, stormwater stuff. Who's providing? Who's obtaining the environmental permits, and uh, who's protecting stormwater runoff and all that? You want to identify who's who's doing that between the sub and the GC. Maybe that's its own sub. I've done it both ways. Sometimes I contracted, this is a stormwater prevention sub. They're doing it all. Sometimes I say, okay, you're doing your piece, you're doing your piece. And but you want to know ahead of time, right? You don't want to be responsible for stormwater across the site where you're not working unless you're getting paid for it. Um, 
And this gets into to planning. So not only is it, does it make good business sense to plan, so can, example of a crane pick, right? It doesn't just make good business sense to only use, to, to maximize the efficiency of your crane. It makes it s a safer environment. So we plan ahead a lot for logistics. We could all do better planning ahead for safety, which I say we're pretty good at it as an industry, we're especially as compared to you know 30 years ago. But we have to always keep that in mind. Okay, this is going to be the most convenient place for to make this pick with this crane because I can reach these four picks with this one setup or whatever. But okay, how does that impact safety? What kind of safety personnel am I, I going to need? What kind of safety equipment am I going to need because of that? And that's just one example, but it applies to almost everything we do, right? And here's a. How do you. Again, I'm going to pick on you. But so site, and I'd like to hear your thought too. So site housekeeping, so cleanup. Who is responsible for that? You, do you do it all? Do you make subcontractors do it? Do you, what's, what's the cleanup? I, and I ask this because I'm genuinely yeah, curious. So we're just, just, to, just to be clear, we're usually the owner's rep. We're not, we're okay, not a right. contractor. Right, okay. Okay. But it's usually us browbeating them because that's an afterthought. Right. For, for an unpaid contractor. Yeah. House, good housekeeping is the last thing right. that they want to do because right. it's not a production activity. Yes. And it's not, it's not pouring concrete. Right. Which is all they want to do. Right. So that's, that's yeah. a challenge. Yeah. But it, it absolutely needs to be on our list. Yeah. And an, a site with a lack of cleanliness is an unsafe site and it's one of my biggest pet peeves because uh, it doesn't take much you know you throw back to the tin cans coke cans you throw a coke can on the fl on the ground now what have you just identified that spot on the ground as that's this place where all the coke cans go right whether you meant to or not you let that sit there long enough, and now that becomes the dumping area, right? Oh, well, I guess that's where you're supposed to throw our cans or our trash or our... Yeah, because it just people, we see it, and oh, I guess that's what, I guess that's what we do here. So you've got to stay on top of it. So, so I would, in my, all my subcontracts, I would put a specific inclusion. Daily cleanup. Not weekly. D every day, clean up all your trash. Uh, and I rarely got any pushback on it, but because you just identified the, the dumping ground of the site and then it spreads and then it's unsafe and there's all sorts of problems. But uh, Just quickly some things, a way to actually implement some stuff. So do y'all ever do activity or job hazard analysis, AHA or JHA? Do you ever have to do those? Do y'all you ever do them or require them? Yeah. Not okay. So the the idea is so activity hazard analysis so you pick so you're pouring concrete okay and so let's let's just say it's paving right you're pouring some paving pick that activity and identify what hazards could go into that so if you're pumping it and there's power line close by well that's a big one make sure the pump doesn't hit the power line but you don't just say make sure the pump doesn't hit the power line you say, what am I going to do to make sure that the pump doesn't hit the power line? Because right? it's easy to identify it. But that's why we don't call it activity hazard identification, activity hazard analysis, because it's uh, you identify it, then you say, what am I going to do to avoid that? Well, that may be easy. Well, I'm going to set the pump up over here away from the power lines. Or maybe you can avoid it. Okay, I'm going to have, I'm going to assign people that, yeah, a, a flagman basically or, or whatever there's lots of different ways you can do even just that one little task way to do, to do it but um, yeah signs or whatever um, so important to identify but then not just be aware plan how you're going to avoid them or mitigate that risk uh, and so some some of that way to mitigate is just staffing so you all do have a safety manager on site so that's a great way to do it um, some companies don't do that but they have someone that goes and checks in some may they may put the foreman in charge um, and 
So I, I like this point. Superintendent has overall site safety responsibility. That the AIA, so going back to the American Institute of Architects, the AIA contract. So the AIA produce produces a contract that is pretty common that will be signed between owners and and construction managers. Um, it specifically says the superintendent is responsible for safety. So it's not just kind of this idea we have in the industry. Oh yeah, superintendent's the boss. He's in charge of everything, including safety. No. While that is true, it's more than that. It specifically says in the contract, the superintendent, and it defines who the superintendent is, is responsible for safety. So it's not just a good thing for a superintendent. Now, whether you, know, whether you call him a foreman or superintendent, you know, if he fits the description, he's a superintendent according to that contract, is legally responsible for safety, which is why if a superintendent in intentionally doesn't address safety issues and someone gets hurt they could end up in jail so it's beyond just a good idea it's you're contractually and legally obligated to be in charge of safety um, so it's the way kind of the way of the government pushing social responsibility on us kind of like we were talking about with sustainability um, which is not necessarily a bad thing uh, and we'll go through these these are you can read through these quickly there we won't spend too much time on them. Um, but it says every, I actually should have changed that at least every week. So y'all do any kind of regular, you know, toolbox talks meetings or, you know, assessing, doing a site walk to assess any safety issues. And y it may be that you just do it continually and your safety manager does that. Or during the day. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's different ways of, of handling it. It could be s that's someone's only responsibility, so that's constant. If it's someone that comes and checks in, uh, the the point is there should be a regular structured way of how do we make sure that we don't just start with a safe site, we continually have a safe site. Uh, an OSHA log, and if, an o if OSHA ever shows up for an inspection, have you ever... Had the privilege of participating in OSHA? Okay. They've shown up for good reason. Okay. <laughs> but not not okay. Activity. Gotcha. I have one time. You have? Yeah. 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 Whoa. It's like a blitz, huh? Whoa. That's fun. That's fun. <laughs> Looking for something to do. Oh my gosh. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> we had to work three. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, those are fun. I, I've, I've had one, yeah, two pop ins, but they were both, it was just one person. They're actually, real, actually really nice. <laughs> they didn't issue any citations, so I, I had great experiences. 
Yeah. 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 And uh <laughs> right. Oh man. How convenient. But I know for the the one big inspection that I was involved in uh where there's an an accident uh and so I was one of the I was the only bilingual person on the management staff so I got to follow the inspector both days she was there um, and translate for us. She was interviewing people, which was a pain, but really looking back, I, I learned a whole lot about the, the process. So I'm not going to say I'm thankful for it, but it ended up being a good situation. So um, one thing that she loved is we flooded her with paperwork. I mean, all of our meetings that we'd had, we had sign-in sheets and a uh, Description of the discussion topic. Everyone that was doing anything that required certification, crane operators, welders, whatever, we had a copy of their certification card. So we just flooded her, showing that we were doing our due diligence. It wasn't just, oh yeah, we're kind of trying to be safe. Was, no, we are actively, actively maintaining a safe site, and this is how we're doing it. So if you have a safety meeting, get a sign-in sheet and keep a copy of it on site on that site now once you go to the next project you know maybe keep it in the file but you know for the whole site so if you have a safety meeting in january and osha shows up in december you want to and if you're on the same project keep it uh anything any kind of informal training you had uh especially if you went sent someone to get you know an osha 10 hour or 30 hour or something but even if it was informal so-and-so uh, showed up today for the first day. This is how we uh, yeah. described orientation. doesn't need to be real technical. It can be two sentences. Uh, spend the day and just keep a log of it. But the more you can show that you're doing your due diligence, the better. Because that's really what they... Uh, in my experience with ocean inspectors, they're not just trying to be mean. They really want to have a safe site. Um, and kind of back to the worst thing you can do is just give everyone a binder. But you do want to have that binder, right? You should be intentional about what do we do to maintain a safe company and safe job sites. Not just we like safety and we think it's good. So it sounds like y'all have um, at least a plan on site. We hire a safety manager and he is on site. Okay, well, that's part of your safety plan, safety policy. So you probably have a document somewhere that lists all the things you do. So having these policies in place, that's another thing you'd give to the OSHA inspector if, if you ever need to. But always have a copy of it. Obviously, you can have a copy in the office, but you want a copy on site um, to refer to if you if you don't know, well, what are we supposed to do when a new guy shows up? Um, but also to show OSHA, this is what we do. Now, they'll ask you. They'll make sure, okay, you say that you do this. Are you doing that? But So you'll be held accountable for it. But you do want to have a copy of it. Okay, real quick through cost control and the, the principles are real simple. Um, the idea behind cost control, so let me, let me back up a little bit here. So what is cost control? My husband swears I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So we know what the lack of cost control is. All right. All right. And I don't, I don't have a textbook definition. Make yeah. Sure, make sure that your financial bleed rates is in accordance with your expectations. Yeah. So planning what you're going to spend and having some system of making sure you're staying, you're sticking to that budget. So budgeting, but beyond just budgeting, how do you stick to the budget? Uh, so cost control is not, uh, someone described it to me as a, uh, uh, oh, what are the what is a medical examiner autopsy? It's not an autopsy, all right? Just an right. It's not just this is our budget. Uh, I'll go do the project. Okay, do we stick to the budget? That's not cost control. That's just an autopsy. You find out what killed you, right? Well, who cares, right? 
if you're if you're bankrupt, who cares? What I mean, I guess it's a nice lesson learned for everyone else, but um, it's an active monitoring of how is your spending keeping in line with your budget. So, it, and uh, what McCarthy posed in, in his book, and it's just a, I really like the way he I kind of it's kind of what I did anyway, but he put it in language that was really, he defined it really well, so I just kind of kept his, his words for the most part, but it's not just a top-down, right? It's not upper management saying, this is what you're going to spend, okay? It's much more than that. That's not active cost control, okay? Now, the management may be the ones monitoring performance and, and cost, but they're not just saying, this is what you have to spend, go spend it, and don't spend anymore. Okay, that's not, that's not good cost control, um, because if it's top down, it's just management issuing c instructions, monitoring performance. You know, okay, we made a note of low productivity, but then what? Um, we went and fixed them, but okay, it could be better. Maybe we could prevent problems. Uh, so this kind of the the reaction to that is a distributed system for real time correction and long term improvement. So. The trade labor, whether that's the laborers, the carpenters, the foreman, superintendent, whoever, folks on site, they understand what the goals are and what so what needs to be done and how to get there. Um, but this is a real a real key point. Trade labor. Now I'm not advocating that you let everyone on site have you know give them authority to make decisions that impact the budget, but at least some people on site should have that authority. Um, so this idea of self-control is knowing what is supposed to be done and having the authority to do it, um, knowing what's going to be done now, uh, which is possible with that top-down approach. Um, and it's, it's important to break it down so you don't want just one. So your budget is not just what's the total cost, right? We have That's why we do a detailed budget. But it's hard to analyze a big project. It's even completed projects, you know, comparing one to another, they're too dissimilar to really compare. That's why we break down into the line items. Because we may have, okay, this project, project A and project B as a whole may be different, but the pieces of them may be really similar. So that's a good way to be able to analyze. Um, some issues with just kind of, you know, doing the whole autopsy report thing is record keeping may not be ideal, you know especially if it's a fluid activity, when there are fluid activities on site, which is pretty much all the time. Um, accounting for all the, you know, how you use labor differently than was budgeted is, is difficult to, when you're looking at it in retrospect, right? So you want to keep on top of that uh, kind of in real time. Uh, so these high quality data sets with all those little, the nuances of how you spent your labor, how you spent your money on materials are not always available. So you want to focus your efforts on what you do have. So you may pick a few big ticket items. So you spend a lot of labor on form work or you know, on rod busters or whatever. You, know, you have a lot of info on that. So let's analyze those and find where we can improve on the next one. Um, recording productivity. So um, a way of doing cost control is monitoring productivity. Uh, Pick a crew and monitor, and uh, we'll, well, we'll get into the whole value-added activities uh, later. But um, and y so productivity in, in any type of labor is over time, right? It's not just a material purchase. That just happens at a point in time. There's a dollar associated with it. But labor happens over time. So two-week, kind of a rule of thumb is if you're, Analyzing productivity for cost control purposes, uh, two weeks is a good uh, could good rule of thumb to, to break it into two-week chunks. If you're trying to improve your productivity, you're trying to monitor how you're spending, two weeks is a good rule of thumb. I, it's enough time to, to kind of account for the, hey, we were really good this day, but not so good the next day. It's enough enough that you'll kind of, you'll average out the good days and bad days, but not so much that you're not getting good information. Uh, 
it's the idea of productivity modifiers. So in different situations, how does productivity, how is productivity affected in different, so if you're doing night work, what's the productivity doing work at night versus during the day? Um, so you wanna, you wanna know those things for the next time you bid or budget a job. Okay, this is night work or this is, it's all sorts of different scenarios. We're going right after this other contractor. We're going right before we need to keep ahead or such and such has happened simultaneously. That may impact your sim your productivity. Well, you need to know that for the next time you go and budget. So, well, one last thing I want to say on this was uh, was about this actually. It's a really long heading. Repeat cycle for continuous improvement. Evaluate results of implemented corrective actions. Repeat cycle to gain further improvements. So you, I don't know if y'all have heard the buzzword lean. So you talk about lean production, lean construction. It's really a manufacturing term. Uh, we're trying to adopt it and apply it to construction uh, to varying degrees of success. Uh, but the idea is how do we continuously improve our process? So one example would be, so let, let's say, let's just say you're, you're finishing, you're pouring and finishing concrete, right? A way to apply lean principles would be for you to sit on the side, not actually get involved in the work, which is important. You can't get involved, which is for me, that's hard. I want to get, I hate standing and watching other people work, but not get in the, m in the mix, stand and watch and observe what everyone's doing. So the finishers, okay, they spend X amount of time not working. And it may not be just because they're, they're being lazy or they want to. Maybe just the process, well, we didn't have the trucks timed. Or the, the, the route the trucks come in and leave the site is such that there's this gap and my finishers are all standing around for 15 minutes every hour just because of the way we route the trucks. Or, you know, if you're late, say you're setting uh, – reinforced concrete pipe in the ground you know there may be some guys are standing off doing nothing waiting for this and they take turns well how do we how do we make use of that downtime that's the kind of the whole idea behind improving that's a really kind of watered down description but that's the gist of it so what is the non-value added and getting back to that term of value added what are what are the steps and pieces that are non-value added. So standing around waiting for a truck is not adding value to anything. So what do we do to prevent that downtime? Keep now there is a limit to human effort. Right? You can't just work someone all day non nonstop, but, which is why we're about to take a break, but um, uh, that's kind of the idea behind it, right? So identify those things that are non-value added and find ways to eliminate them. And eliminate them is not just saying, hey, get to work. Maybe sometimes it is, but most of the time it's not. Usually it's, what, how do I change the process so that we don't have that downtime? All right, let's take a short break. Let's actually keep it to 10 minutes this time, and we'll kind of run through the closing comments and summary, and we'll be done.